Praise the Lord. I want to start by just blessing the Lord for the three days of prayers that we had as vigils, midnight prayers, three days uh, was not my idea. The Lord said we should do it. And I know that there will be testimonies concerning that. It is impossible for you to have been any of the nights of that vigil and not to have received. It is impossible. Uh, if you don't know it already, very soon you will know that prayers that are uttered in healing wings, <laughs> uh, they have a, 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 an incredible way by, by which God just answers them. He answers them speedily. He answers them readily. So you know, we spent three nights. Huh? When he told me about it, I knew it was a setup. And I know all kinds of things that I suffered because I decided to obey, because the enemy was just didn't want it to happen. So if you came, know that God has worked some fantastic thing in your life. I want to thank God, especially for inspiring the prayers for our children. I didn't know there were so many children in Healing Wings, 60 something children. I was able to call their names. Chuchu helped me to help me pick their names. Uh, uh, yeah, Missy, yeah, made sure I didn't forget Azba, I didn't forget Nara. Uh, I know that Lord God Almighty has touched every single one of our dear children. Mm? They are the heritage of our God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful things that you are doing in Healing Wings, Chapel of Faith, Father, Lord, God Almighty. You raised off for this special time when people are suffering with pandemics, different variants, different diseases, different problems, oh God, but you have raised us as a healing ministry. And Father, Lord, God Almighty, <laughs> this is the most powerful ministry that I can imagine. This is the most powerful ministry that I can imagine. And I just want to thank you. I just want to bless you because I'm seeing such incredible things. I never imagined when God called me that this kind of power that exists in healing wings will be here. Never imagined it. Please, please, please take advantage of it. It is not in one person. It is in us. We are one body. It is in us as a fellowship. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, we are here again to glorify your name. Daddy, I come and stand the office to which you have appointed me. Yes, I want to magnify this ministry. You have appointed me as a prophet. Yes, it took me 25 years to accept it. <laughs> but Lord God Almighty, I stand in that office and I go back to roots today. I want to talk this morning about the parable of the mustard seed. Uh, going back again to kingdom dynamics. That's where we started. That's where God started teaching me, visiting me, and telling me about the nature of the character of his kingdom. And today, I want to address the parable of the mustard seed. One day, the Lord asked me one of those nagging questions that turned my faith upside down. And he said, Femi, does a mustard seed become a tree? And I found the question confusing. What's the meaning of that question? Does the mustard seed become a tree? Of course it becomes a tree. The Lord himself preached about it. He told us the mustard seed will become a tree. And that is, will be emblematic of the kingdom of God. It will go from a tiny mustard seed to be a big tree 
that would cover the earth and the birds of the air would come and nestle, would come and rest on it. Huh? But when God asks you a question, <laughs> he knows you don't know the answer. When God asks you a question, I always say, don't be in a hurry to answer. Therefore, uh, the question for me was unexpected. It made me angry. I said, you know, what does this mean? He said, nevertheless, at your word, let me check. Let me find out. Does the mustard seed become a tree? Uh, the answer was very annoying. I discovered to my great surprise that the mustard seed never becomes a tree. And that's why I have come to talk to us today. I have had been given the wrong impression going by the literal application of Jesus's message that the mustard seed becomes a tree. But the mustard tree is virtually non-existent. It only exists in Christian churches and they are planted by Nicodemus pastors. The disciples came to Jesus and said, why? Why are you always speaking to the people in parables? Why can't you speak plainly to the people? And Jesus replied to them, he said, I speak in parables because I don't want them to understand what I'm saying. And when you tell Christians this, they don't believe that Jesus says this. I don't want them to understand what I'm saying. Let me read it to you in Matthew 13, 10. He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So what do we have? Jesus' parables are often intended to conceal than they are to reveal. To understand his parables, God has to open your heart. God has to open your ears. In the portrait of the kingdom of God, his parables turn everything upside down. He despised Samaritan and not the godly priests or the Levite turn out to be the righteous hero of the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus' good shepherd is reckless. He leaves 99 sheep unattended and went to look for one solitary sheep that is lost. And the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, it is the ungodly tax collector that goes away justified and not the religious so-called godly Pharisee. In the story of the prodigal son, a party is thrown for the prodigal who left and squandered his resources and not for the faithful son who stayed behind. In another parable, a master commended an unrighteous servant for his unrighteousness and he proclaimed him to be wise. Sons of this world, they are wiser in their generation, says Jesus than the sons of the kingdom. That is kingdom dynamics. The first become last. The last become first. Jesus' parables, they are designed to confound our preconceptions. They are designed to administer a shock to the system. They stop us in our yardsticks and lead us to ask, how can this possibly be? You see, we're used to telling it as it is. 
Whereas the whole essence of Jesus' parables is to tell it as it is not. This is because the ways of the kingdom are not the ways of men. Therefore, Jesus' parables expose many religious myths as false answers to life's realities. They shatter our sensibilities, our comfortable sensibilities, by confounding widespread and accepted myths about the ways of God, about the values and the practices of our God. Unfortunately, we are no longer offended by them because the parables are designed to offend us into a new reality. Unfortunately, we're no longer offended by them because the myths have again taken over the parables and we have become lost again. So let us look at the anomalies of Jesus's mustard seed. Hmm? Because true to form, Few things about Jesus' parables conform to reality. The mustard is not the smallest of all seeds. That distinction actually goes to the orchid seed. The mustard never, ever, never becomes a tree. Mustard is a herb, so it never grows into anything like a tree. All the varieties of the mustard plant have very thin stems and branches, ensuring that they cannot be anything by any stretch of imagination. They cannot be called a tree. At best, they grow into shrubs. Most birds would not nestle in a mustard plant because of the stinging aroma. Of course, Jesus is aware of these anomalies, of these contradictions. But true to form, he is a rock of offense. And he is, he intentionally offends the sensibilities of the Jewish farmer. To expose a falsehood, to expose a myth, a story must sometimes be outrageous and offensive. The mustard is appropriate for this because it is biting. If you've had it in a hot dog, you know that. It is biting, it is irritating, it is a disturbing condiment. It is therefore well suited to the gospel of the kingdom, which irritates and disturbs those who are at peace in this world. You see, the Jews believed that the kingdom of God will bring about the restoration of Israel to its former power and glory. And the symbol of that power was the cedar of Lebanon. With the advent of a kingdom, it was anticipated that Israel would be restored as a mighty cedar, head and shoulders above its neighbors. The cedar itself was magnificent by every account. It grew straight up so many hundred feet into the air, sometimes as high as 300 feet. Every kind of bird nestles in its branches and seek refuge in its shade. And so the expectation that this is what is going to happen to Israel seemed to be confirmed in the revelation that God gave to Daniel. I'm going to read it, Daniel 4. 10 to 12. These were the visions of my head while on my bed, says Daniel. I was looking and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant. And in it were food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens 
dwelt in his branches and all flesh fed from it. Very, very impressive tree. Except that when you look closely at Daniel's revelation, which God gave him on his bed, no sooner had he received this vision than the Lord said to Daniel, cut the tree down, cut it down. Why is this tree so offended, offensive to God? We will soon find out. Ezekiel tells us that the counsel of the Lord is to bring down the high tree and to exalt the low tree. Isaiah starts his message with a similar revelation. He says, and I quote, the day of the Lord of hosts will come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, upon all the high mountains, upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower, upon every fortified wall, upon all the ships of Tarshish, upon all the beautiful slopes, the loftiness of man shall be brought down, and the haughtiness of man shall be brought low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. So this should already tell us that God is not going to present in this world his own kingdom that is going to be tall like the cedar of Lebanon. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Okay? So, hear and understand. When Jesus told the parable of the mustard seed, he actually wanted his disciples to know that the kingdom of God is not going to be about trees. It is actually going to be about shrubs. The kingdom of God does not come as a tree going high up into the sky. No, no, Jose. It is not like a proud tall tree designed to tower far above all others. No. On the contrary, the kingdom of God is going to grow as a weed. It's going to grow as a shrub. It's going to grow as an underbush. It is going to spread quietly on the ground. We need a change, a change of mind. We need the eyes of our understanding to become open because Nicodemus pastors, their job is to confuse us. Jesus says, and I quote, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed which grows to be a large tree with the birds of the air nesting in its branches. What does this mean? Let us use Jesus to understand Jesus. Jesus reveals elsewhere that the birds, birds that are nesting in the mustard trees are not angels, but demons. Matthew identifies the birds of the air as the wicked one who steals the word of God from the hearts of men. In Matthew 13, 4, Mark connects the best of the air with Satan in Mark 4, 4. Luke does the same thing in Luke 8, 5. In effect, Jesus portrays the current deviant form of the kingdom of God. His mother seed not only experiences deviant growth, aberrant growth, the beds of the air nesting in his branches are demons. They are demons. They are messengers of Satan, the wicked one, intending to steal the word of God from the hearts of men. Jesus says, furthermore, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. Accordingly, 
the modern church is overrun by demons who plant weed among God's wheat. These weeds, they now occupy strategic positions in the churches as pastors, as bishops, as general overseers. They are revered as fathers in the Lord, as papa, as daddy. In contravention of Jesus' instruction that we should call no one on earth a father except God in heaven. God allows this to happen just as he allowed Satan to tempt Job, just as the Holy Spirit took Jesus to be tempted of the devil, just as Jesus allowed Peter to be sifted as wheat. He allows all kinds of things to happen because only the strong prevail to inherit his kingdom. Jesus' portrait, therefore, is, identifi is, is, is identifiable in its perverseness as the end time mystery Babylon of the book of Revelations. Uh, and it's that mystery Babylon that represents today's Christian church. Go to Revelation 17, five and see it. The church today is a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. I'm quoting Revelation 18.2. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like putting yeast in a large portion of dough. While pastors with limited understanding of the kingdom, of kingdom dynamics, will tell you that this yeast is highly beneficial because it is designed to promote rapid numerical growth of the church. <laughs> Those who have a better understanding of spiritual matters will tell you that yeast is counterproductive precisely because it leads to the exponential growth of a church because that exponential growth is contrary to God's original design. Hmm? The church therefore ceases to be God's church when uh, Doctrines of God were perverted on the altar of church growth. It became a counterfeit of the true church, even though it still called itself Christian. It formed an, holy, an unholy alliance with Rome. And Rome brought into the church many facets of pagan mystery religions. By allowing the scriptures to interpret itself, to, print, to interpret themselves, we quickly discover that the yeast in the Bible is a metaphor for a corrupting agent. The yeast infects the dough and makes the bread to be puffed up and proud. Therefore, yeast was required to be thrown away at the Passover. The law of Moses maintains that no male offering should be made with yeast, Leviticus 6.17. Jesus himself uses yeast to characterize the duplicitous doctrine and the infectious hypocrisy of the religious leaders. He warns us, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisee, which is hypocrisy. And so as the church grew from a tiny seed into a small mustard bush, it was as God designed it. But over time, with the yeast applied by the pastors, it mutated into a large tree, something that God never intended. It became a freak giant tree, not in keeping with its genetic code. So big did it become, in fact, that demons safely reside in it. It therefore became, it stopped being God's church when 
the doctrines of God were perverted simply because people were interested in numbers. They wanted the church to grow. People do all kinds of things because they just want a big church. Huh? They just want a big church. It was still called Christian, but it had no longer anything to do with Christ. Okay. Now, the true church of Jesus Christ is not supposed to be impressive by world standards. It cannot possibly be anything like the mighty Roman Catholic Church. It cannot in any way resemble today's mega churches. It is not the way of God to use the mighty, to use the great, to use the noble, to use the proud to do his work. He has instead a distinct preference for the base, for the weak, for the insignificant, according to 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to 28. Through the parable of the, of, 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 of the mustard seed, Jesus defined the acceptable parameters of his church. He told us his church will be small in size. Luke 12, 32, Jesus says, do not fear little flock for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus's flock is little, it's a little flock, but that should not bother it. It should not be concerned about it because it will inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus tells us the workers in his church will be small in number. He says in Luke 10 2, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. He tells us the membership of his church will be elected. Matthew 20, 16, he says, many are called, but few, few are chosen. He tells us the pathway to his kingdom is going to be found only by a small number of people and not by the crowd that these churches are aspiring to. In Matthew 7, 14, Jesus says, narrow is the gate. Difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few, few who find it, who find it. Therefore, these crowded churches should not be confused with the church of Christ. Jesus says, when the son of man comes, will he really find faith on earth? Since according to the reputable Pew Research Center, there are no less than 2 billion so-called Christians now on earth, more than any other religion, the conclusion is inexplicable. Most of today's Christians do not have, cannot have the kind of faith that Jesus is talking about or that Jesus is looking for. The parable of the mustard seed is also significant in other respects. The man who plants the mustard seed plants it illegally in the garden. According to the law of Moses, you should not mix different seeds in the same garden. Deuteronomy 22, 9 says, you shall not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed, lest the yield of the seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard is defiled. No self-respecting Jewish farmer will plant a mustard seed 
in a household garden. Because the mustard seed grows and spreads very quickly. It doesn't limit itself to delineated parameters set for it. It is likely to invade the allotted species of other vegetables in the garden. So the man in Jesus' parable who plants a seed in the garden is doing something foolish as well as illegal according to the law. In a vegetable garden, the mustard seed will grow like a weed. It becomes an agent of confusion, an agent of disorder. Therefore, the point of planting it is not to turn it into what it is not, which is a tree, but to maximize what it is as a marauding seed of confusion, an offensive plant that is planted illegally. Uh, as a weed, the mustard seed becomes a veritable force to be reckoned with. But you see, a weed operates in secret. It operates clandestinely. It might not be immediately visible, but its impact is inexorable. As Isaiah reveals, the mustard seed is very much like Jesus himself. And so Isaiah says, who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow us before him, not as a tree, but as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we heed as his were our faces from him. He is despised and we did not esteem him. Therefore, what we see all around us today is a false church headed by false popes, false pastors, false bishops. The counterfeit church is large. It is flamboyant. It is worldly. It is very attractive to men. But God's true church is a little flock of little ones led by not pastors, not bishops, not popes, but by one good shepherd, Jesus himself. By presenting the kingdom of God as a mustard seed that grows to become a tree, Jesus was given a prophecy about the coming perversion of church growth, which is already upon us. Jesus' parable of the mustard seed is a prophecy of the history of a Christian church. He foresees its historical development from the true church of humble beginnings. Mustard seed is small, seemingly insignificant. Jesus himself is his embodiment he is a mustard seed that the father plants in Bethlehem, Ephrata, planted in the earth. However, today, pastors who are preoccupied with putting up massive and imposing church buildings are not following any blueprint. They use every possible means to advertise themselves and to publicize their programs. They place themselves at the forefront of every social activity. Like James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they crave positions of prominence. But you and I know that Jesus never intended that for his disciples. 
we are expected to walk in lowliness and meekness. We are not supposed to make our voices heard in the streets. Isaiah 42, one to three says of Jesus, behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. So Jesus' parable of the mustard seed is actually designed to dispel all grandiose mythical and self-serving expectations of the kingdom of God. In its current aberrant form in the world, the church, which is deemed to represent the kingdom of God, is full of anomalies. It has tears as well as wheat. It is the lodging of demons. It propagates doctrines like yeast that are corrupting in their influences. It experiences such apparent growth as to be likened to a mustard seed becoming a tree. Thanks to Nicodemus pastors, the myths about the kingdom of God have once again recaptured the true meaning of Jesus' portrait. And so people are back again to planting cedars of Lebanon in the name of promoting the kingdom of God. What we know now in the churches are actually the kingdom of pastors. And these have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Churches are personal empires built through the distortion of the scriptures for the sake of collecting as many tithes and offerings as possible. Our so-called men of God now include jet-setting, designer-suited, internationally acclaimed superstars. However, the true children of God are despised they are rejected by the people. My brother, my sister, there are so many self-serving myths about the kingdom of God that have been fabricated by pastors. Don't be seduced by them. They tell men that the kingdom of God is going to expand until it covers the whole earth. So when a mega pastor holds a crusade and manages to gather hundreds or thousands of people in one place. They claim the kingdom of God is on the move. They boast that God is now using combined harvesters to bring people into the kingdom of God. This is erroneous. Let us just listen to Jesus, Luke 17, 20. The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. The parable of the mustard seed is meant to change these kinds of nonsensical views about the ways of God. But the pastors have twisted it again. Uh, the old mindset has led men once again into the same misconceptions that Jesus sought to contradict 
in the first place. The myth persists because Christians don't like the truth of the gospel and they don't want to believe it. And so pastors are back again, telling us, yes, kingdom of God is a mustard seed that is going to become a tree. They are back to preaching about small beginnings and great endings. They are back to preaching that these small beginnings and great endings are all going to occur in this life. But in this life, the kingdom of God is about small beginnings and modest endings. Are you seeking great things for yourself? Ask Jeremiah. Seek them not. Jeremiah 45, verse 5. God is not out to make us great in this world. On the contrary, he is out to make us hated and despised. We will only be great in the eyes of the Lord. Those seeking honor and glory from doing the work of God are highly mistaken. Those things that meet the approval of men are not God's idea of success. That is why he creates a different category and calls it good success. In the eyes of God, what men call success are abject failures. The greatest works of the kingdom are accomplished in secret. They are unseen, they are unsung. They are reflected in the Beatitudes. They exist in our heart of hearts. They are not found in great accomplishments. They are not expressed through the holding of big crusades and outreaches and other public jamborees. Listen to what God says to Isaiah. Quit your worship charades. I can't stand your trivial religious games, monthly conferences, weekly Sabbaths, special meetings, 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 meetings. I can't stand one more. Meetings for this, meetings for that. I hate them. You have worn me out. I'm sick of your religion, religion, religion. While you go right on sinning, when you put on your next prayer performance, I will be looking the other way. No matter how long or loud or often you pray, I will not be listening. It is in your Bible. I'm reading from Isaiah 1, 13 to 14. In the message translation, Jesus wants us to think small, not to think big. The tasks that he has given us, they are not accomplished by filling huge stadiums, by making intercontinental television broadcasts. God's greatest works are not done on such vain glorious basis. They are not done in cathedrals. They are not done in big theaters. They are not done in mausoleums where two or three are gathered. That's where they are done. They are accomplished in Bethlehem Ephrata, which though it is little among the cities of Judah, it is nevertheless the one that is appointed to do great things. 
The kingdom of God is like a little mustard seed that is sown in us. It is growing, but it is not going to turn us into cedars of Lebanon. We will be doing excellently well if we become modest shrubs. The kingdom is accomplished in us, in the mundane details of everyday life. It is fulfilled by small acts of love and kindness, encouraging the afflicted, supporting the weak. Nothing about this will be carried in the news. Nothing about this will be proclaimed on billboards. Nothing about this will be extolled on television. With Jesus himself, a few sick people get healed, and then he is crucified, leaving behind a rag tag down and out set of disciples. Yesterday and today, they are characterized by some street men, by some criminals, by some prostitutes, by some low-lifers, by some indigent fishermen. God's great victory of the resurrection was not even televised. Jesus only appeared to a small number of carefully chosen people. To all intents and purposes, the true work of the gospel ends in failure, not in success. Isaiah was duly one. God told him, no matter what you say to these people, they will not listen to you. So tell them to keep on hearing, but not understand. Isaiah foresaw that Jesus would See, would also labor in vain. And so in Isaiah 49, verse 4, we have the plaint of the Messiah. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I've spent my strength and in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me? is in the Lord's hand and my reward is with my God. Isaiah 41, four, the Messiah's verdict of his own ministry. The authentic ministry of Christ is not glamorous. It is humiliating. It is frustrating. The ministry of Christ is a thankless task. The true child of God is despised and rejected by the people. When I had one pastor who was chosen by Newsweek to be one of the 100 most influential men, I said, they have finished his ministry. They have finished his ministry. People were congratulating him. I shook my head. I said, oh, my shoe. Huh? Because if he belongs to Christ, he will be hated to be despised. Jesus is the one whom man despises. He is the one whom the nation abhors. Therefore, the popular pastor or evangelist is a contradiction in terms because if he preaches the Jeremiah's, he will be hated by the people. If he tells the truth, people will not like what he says. And you watch some television programs when people are preaching, people are jumping on the chairs, people are shouting, preach, preach. And you know, they cannot be preaching the word that brings men to repentance. The true the believer is to form, the less popular is likely to be because he has come to show the people their sins to bring them to repentance. Therefore, today's celebrated pastor is a contradiction in terms. 
This then is the peculiar concept of the kingdom that Jesus offers his followers. The old way no longer works. This is the time for regime change. The new regime, the kingdom of God that Jesus proclaims is made manifest in the common and the ordinary. We won't find it among the arrogant. We will find it among the simple and the meek. It will be foreign to the proud. It will be local to the humble. It will not be seen among those who have made a name for themselves or those who have inherited a name. It will be named among those who have been disinherited and are unknown. Out of the adversity of believers, God is nevertheless determined to bring forth the sons of God. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all he had and bought it. Matthew 13, 45 to 46. This presents another remarkable kingdom dynamic. You see, the power is the only jewel known to man that is not buried in the earth. It is not found on the ground. The pearl comes from a living organism called the oyster. The first thing that we need to know about the oyster is that it is not kosher. That means it is forbidden to eat oysters in the law of Moses. The second thing to know about oysters is that they produce pearls in response to irritation. When they are troubled and bothered, they produce pearls. Uh, when they are troubled and bothered, they produce pearls in self-defense. Even so, those who seek the Lord, even in the counterfeit churches, they become his pearls. They will be rescued from their inconvenient places of growth and will become God's glorious adornment. Take a look at this. It's the only scripture that I have come to show you today. God says, they shall be mine on the day that I make them my jewels and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Let us pray. Let us go to the Lord again this morning and say, Father, Lord, God Almighty, let the eyes of my understanding be enlightened. Let the eyes of my understanding be enlightened. Father, Lord, God Almighty, let me know the things that are equal. The things that you want to tell me, flesh and blood cannot reveal them to me. But you, O oh God, your ways are not the ways of men. Therefore, Lord, 
teach me your ways. Give me the grace, Lord, to accept your ways. Father Lord, help me so that I am not carnally minded. Help me to be spiritually minded. Help me, Lord, to seek your kingdom. Not food and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Tell the Lord, Father, I am relying on you. I am depending on you to open my ears so that I can hear you, to open my eyes so that I can see you, to direct my path so that I can walk in your ways. Help me, oh God, that I am not seduced by vanity. Help me, oh God, so that I am not seduced by vain glories of this world. I'm not seduced by the pride of life. I'm not seduced by the loss of the eyes, by the loss of the flesh. Father, Lord, God Almighty, help me to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Pentola, please pray for us. Good morning, church. <clears throat> In Jesus' name, Heavenly Father, we, we come before you this morning and we submit our hearts to you. Father, we ask that you will search our hearts, that you will seek our hearts, oh God. That anything, Father Lord Almighty, that is preventing us from understanding your word. Lord, help us to remove it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we ask that you will help us so that our hearts receive the entirety of your word, of your truth, oh God. Help us to seek you, Father God, with all of our being. Help us to understand what you want, Father God Almighty. Help us to understand your ways, Father. And help us, Father, to pursue that understanding with full knowledge of oh God. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would teach us to remember that you are the still small voice, that you're not in the thunder, you're not in the lightning, but you're the still small voice. Help us to listen out for that still small voice, O oh God. Help us to follow and heed that still small voice, Father God Almighty. Help us not to be led astray, Father God Almighty, by the noise and the thunderings, O oh God. Our Father and our God, we ask that you will perfect all that concerns us, O God. Amen. Teach us to go back to you, to the basics, O God. Teach us, Father God Almighty, to understand that the basic foundation you want from us to, to seek is to seek you with all of our hearts, with all of our being, with all of our soul. Help us to make you our priority, O God. Help us to see only you and nothing else, O God. Help us, Father God Almighty, not to, not to model our ambition to, to to our aspirations, Father God Almighty, to want to succeed in our jobs, in whatever it is we're doing in our family life. Help us not to make that the objective. Help us to make you the objective, oh God. Amen. Help us, Father God Almighty, to be consumed by you, by your word, by your worship, by your praise, by spending time in your presence, oh God. Help us to seek your kingdom, Father God Almighty. Lord, we ask, oh God, 
that you will go before us, O God, that you will make our crooked paths to be straight, Father God Amen. Almighty. That, Lord Almighty, there will be no confusion, O God, with the things that concern you, O God. That we will heed your voice, O God. We will hear the voice of the Holy Spirit as you speak to us daily. Even when we have situations when we may be angry with you, when we may be upset with you because we feel things are not gone our way. Help us to understand that you're working all things together for our good. Father, Lord Almighty, there's so much to know about you. There's so much to learn about you. And there's also so much for us to unlearn, oh God. Give us the wisdom, the grace to unlearn the things, oh God, that are not from you. And help us to learn the things, oh God, that you desire us to learn, oh God. Help us to walk the footsteps, oh God, of Jesus. Father, Lord Almighty, let us be seen as children of God. Let us not just become a statistics or a number of Christians, oh God. No. Help us, Father God Almighty, to be true Christians. Help us to show forth the nature, the character, the love of God that you have shared abroad in our hearts, O oh God. Help us, Father, to help men around us. Show us how to be compassionate, more compassionate to people around us, O oh God. Show us to show mercy, to teach us to show mercy to people around us, O oh God. Help us to love, Father God Almighty, like you love. My Father, my God, I thank you because I know that the work you have started, the healings you have started in our hearts, of our souls. Father, you will perfect it, O God. Amen. Lord, I thank you, Father God Almighty, because your word will reign supreme in our lives, O God. Amen. Your word will reign supreme in our lives, O God. We will be led by your word and by your voice, O God. Yes, Father, we bless you. We thank you, Father God Almighty, for that which you have started, Lord, you will perfect. Amen. That which you have started, Father, you will perfect. Amen. We thank you, Father God Almighty, because, Lord, your testimonies would never cease from our lips, O oh God. It would never cease from our hearts, O oh God. Amen. Let your name be exalted forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Uzochi, are you here? Uzochi, Madwike. Good morning. Good morning. Please pray for us. Thank you. Your mic is open, but we can't hear anything. All right. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Sorry, sir. I didn't hear what you said. We can hear you. Can you pray for us? All right. Um, in Jesus' name. Amen. My heavenly Father, the Lord of hosts, the King of kings, the Alpha and the Omega, the God of the impossible, the beginning and the end, our everything, we bless your holy name, Almighty God. We thank you, Father Lord Almighty, because you have brought us here, Father Lord, to hear your word, O God. Thank you, O Lord Almighty, because you have brought us here to teach us, Father Lord, and to talk to us, O God, about the fact that you are the God, O Lord, who does not look at the size, O Lord, who does not look at the magnitude of things, Father Lord. You are the God of the little ones, O Lord. You are the God of the small ones, O Lord. You are the God of the David, O Lord. We thank you, Almighty God. We thank you for your word, Father Lord Almighty. We thank you for what you have taught us, O God Almighty. We thank you, Father, Lord Almighty, because you have given us the privilege, O Lord, to stand before you, O Lord, and hear your word, Father, Lord Almighty, to know our place, Father, Lord, in your kingdom, to know the route that you want us to take, Father, Lord Almighty. You have reassured us, Father, Lord Almighty, that you, O God, are always on our side, Father, Lord Almighty. We might not seem great in this world, Father, Lord Almighty. We might not be seen to comply with everything that happens in this world, Father, Lord Almighty, but our kingdom is not of this world, Father Lord. We are working in your kingdom, Father Lord Almighty, in your glory, Father Lord, in your definition, Father Lord, of the lives that we should live, Father Lord Almighty. And for that, O Lord Almighty, we say thank you, Father Lord Almighty. We pray for your guidance, O Lord. We pray for your wisdom, Father Lord Almighty. We pray for your direction, Father Lord, that everything that we do, Father Lord, will be according to your word, Father Lord, 
according to that which you have promised us, Father Lord Almighty, according to the life that you have chosen for us to live, Father Lord Almighty. Lord, we say thank you, King of glory. Lord God Almighty, at the end of the day, Father Lord Almighty, we shall testify that we have walked the walk that you have desired for us, Father Lord, that we have done the things that you have desired for us. We have lived the life that you have desired for us, Father Lord Almighty. We are yours, Almighty and Heavenly Father. And at the end of the day, O oh God, we shall come to give glory to your name, O oh Lord. May your name be glorified and exalted in us, O oh Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed. Blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Let's have a discussion. If you have a question, you have a contribution, can I see your hand up? You have a question or something you want to add or something you want to discuss, please let me see your hand up. Anybody? This is a healing wings tradition. Yes, let me see. Good morning. Good morning. This might not be really relevant, but... Um, it's always relevant. Just go on. When you were talking about yeast, um, you know, at this time that um, the Jews, because we live amongst them, they've started removing yeast from their houses. So from now till Passover, they have to remove everything that has yeast in it, including Oreo cookies, bread. So what do they do? They, how do you know they are removing them? I don't know what, I'm wondering also whether they throw it away or they give it away, they take it to a food bank, but they ha actually have to empty their whole house of everything wow. that has yeast in it. They are still, they are still, they are still with Moses. <laughs> they are there. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's good because it, it also reminds us that the, you know, that the, the that God's seasons don't pass away because these are things that he's established in order to remind us of the spiritual principles. So I mean, the fact that you spoke about it and you brought that up in my own mind um, helps me um, think of, of, of things in a sort of broader uh, way. Well, Jesus celebrated the Passover, so we can also celebrate the Passover. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tala. Yes, good morning again, sir. Morning. Yes, um, I mean, when the discussion was going on, Ladia and I were also just discussing, I was asking him a question, and I mean, I was just thinking that sometimes it just, it just seems a bit, um, should I say, not difficult or maybe modeled up to know how to marry your, um, your desire to want to excel at what you do or which is in life really um, and to want to move on to the next stage um, so if i'm running for example now posh maybe the next thing is i want to open a branch somewhere i want to have a hall somewhere i want to extend it to this you know um how and then because that process is also quite um time consuming um and you know can take your focus off because just how to how you how, how one just constantly has to be um careful not to let those desires um overtake the desire for god or the desire for god's kingdom you know so i mean we're just having that discussion and but you know okay, it's okay. Just, yeah okay for intellect you see god is actually a god of increase and he's a god of multiplication okay so he wants us to increase he wants us, if he gives us something, he wants it to multiply. But he doesn't, he wants us to put him first. So you have a shop and you want it to expand. Don't just decide to do it on your own. Go to him and ask him for permission because he can tell you, right? that in fact, where you want to expand to, they're gonna build a road there and it's gonna create confusion or something is gonna happen or something is not gonna happen or I don't want you to do this because I have other plans for you. Once you include it in your plans, it's honky-dory. Huh? And 
he can make you grow to any extent whatsoever, provided you are always touching base with him. And some people will say, well, you know, uh, it's very easy because you hear from God, you can tell him, if you don't want me to move in this direction, Lord, block it. Uh, and if God doesn't want you to move, he will block it. But make, let there be no misunderstanding. If we have one thing, God wants it to be true. If he, if he gives us one naira, he wants us to grow it. Uh, multiply, that's what he said, have dominion, multiply. He is a God of multiplication. Uh, but everything must have him at the center. Must have him at the center. We, all we need to do is to put him first. And he will direct our path. Don't lean on your own understanding, Solomon says. In all our ways, acknowledge him and he will direct our path. So you are a child of God, Fentola. You can always talk to him and he will show you the way. Martins. Martin Sealy, okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, sir. Okay, um, um, thank you for the message today. It's um, it's it's well grounded in the doctrine of Christ that we've come to know. Um, um, the 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 kernel of it um is that the gospel, the kingdom of God, is not a dog and pony show, as what we have not now seen in in many churches today. Um, my question is, how do we square this with um, what some, some Bible translations now call the Great Commission um, in Mark 16, 15, where Jesus said that we should go out to the world and, and preach his gospel. Um, so, so, so he has made us, he has made us the light of the world. And, and he, he, he even did say that, um, that he cannot light a candle and put it on that basket. And so we are supposed to, in, in all humility, um, in, in alignment with his values, his doctrine, his message, um, show people, others, the world should see the message of Christ in us. Um, so, 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 so how do we do this without it being about us, without drawing attention to ourselves and, and keeping to this mandate that Jesus gave us? Um, I'm just asking this question in light of the message. Yeah. Um, yeah it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very important question. Number one, the Great Commission, right, is man-made, is a man-made construct. Just say, go and preach the gospel. Hmm? But please, let's understand it, because this is part of the reason why I didn't want the ministry that Jesus gave me. Huh? The scripture that is repeated more than any other scripture in the Bible is from Isaiah chapter 6. Go and speak to these people, and they will not accept you what you tell them. Tell them to keep on hearing, but don't understand. It is repeated more than any other scripture. Okay, so he has asked us to go and preach everywhere. But we are fishers of men. And when people fish fish, nobody fishes fish for salvation. Fishes are fished for condemnation. The gospel is preached as a testimony against men because on the last day, they will say, this was preached to you 
and you rejected it. So don't accept the directive of Christ to preach the gospel as something that is going to make you successful. Some people say, I've decided that one million people, I'm going to get one million people to come to the knowledge of Christ. They're wasting their time. Uh, no man can come to Christ unless God draws him. Okay? God knows those who are his. Uh, I fought God. I said, I don't want the ministry of Isaiah. What is the point of a ministry where you are, you are going to talk to people and they will not accept what you tell them until I discovered that that is the only ministry. It is the only ministry. Most people will not accept the gospel. The people that will crowd into the churches are people who have been preached another gospel. They're going to tell them something else. Many are coming there because they want to play the lottery. They go to church to play lottery. You give 10 naira, you get 100. You, give, you know, there are all kinds of bogus reasons where people come to church. I've been in a church, redeemed Christian Church of God, where the man preached that if you come to Christ, you will get a pathfinder. And one man answered the altar call. Uh, so I'm saying it is a great commission, but not in that sense. Please, Martins, I'm still talking to you. Are you okay? Um, yes, I'm, I'm okay. But um, I, 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 see, I, see have, I see have one little struggle. Go on. Should 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 we re, should we accept um, this message of of Christ that He will preach to people and they will not listen to us and and just use that as an excuse not to even talk to people about Christ or should no no we, no no, no. He, 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 he has told you to go and preach you can't <laughs> you, you can't say because they won't they won't they won't listen we are, we are not going to preach no way no way uh, he has told you to go and preach. Okay, and he says, well, if they don't accept what you say, just wipe your feet huh? and move on. But you can't now say, because they won't accept, we will not go to preach. No, that's disobedient. No, 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 no. no. You have to go everywhere. Huh? You have to go everywhere, preach everywhere possible because of the directive and the heart of God. Yes, Mr. Deliki, I hope we can hear you. I hope your system would allow us to hear you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to talk with, uh, in respect uh, that has to do with uh, structures in the churches. I don't know, uh, what, is the, what is Jesus saying about this structure? Because when we look at structure itself, it takes the people away from God. And but how how is church going to be managed without structure? When you have a particular number, they have to be how to they coordinate themselves one way or the other. I don't know. So, but, I, but when we look at Jesus itself, he too has structure, just like okay, he has a treasurer, and then there are some other people that do different kinds of things too, even even in the midst of them being 12. You, you understand? So I don't know. I need a clearer. I'm not uh, sure what exactly is the problem. Well, uh, yeah, I'm talking about structures in the in the church in the churches. Means that if you can, by you can manage, you, you, can, you, you can manage. You know, I mean, uh, this is called healing wings, and we are managing the ministry. What are the structures that you find in healing wings? Which means that you have to. That's why they are talking about the pastors, deacon, uh, evangelists, ever all these offices that we are what talking are, about. What, and what are, what are they doing there? Well, they have different kind of things they do. I don't know, but oh, I yeah, just you tell, you tell you are the one that is talking to me now. What, <laughs> what are they doing? Uh, well, I, I I feel I feel I feel that uh, in some part, so Jesus didn't talk about that, but Paul brought, brought into it, and he brought into it, and I discovered that those things take people away from Christ. 
Probably because I, 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 I used to, I was a, before I joined Healing Wings. Some there are so many have things I joined the church. Wings because so, they want to be, to be deacons. Some people have left Healing Wings because they want to be deacons in, their, in churches, etc. They, you know, they are looking for position. They, they let them go. So I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what your question <laughs> is. That's, that's what I'm saying. Because you are asking the question, you are answering it. Okay, the, the other part I, I wanted to play, like I want to play light on it uh, is what uh, when Martins was talking about uh, should we should we when we went when we go preaching should we not take it important because he said uh, they, they will not listen to us the only the only thing I wanted to say about that is that if God says we should go and preach and we went we are out there preaching is the one that puts the words in our mouth. Whatever we do, it directs our path. So at that point, God has taken taking over us. So it doesn't matter what the result is now. What matters is obedience, obeying his words. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. Thank God. Benedict. Good morning, church. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I think what my brother says, let me just tell me what he just said. Which Mr. brother is this one? Mr. Adotu. OK. I think um, the, the message of Christ, Cripple Church, he, he, the struggle is talking about by the time you face the gospel, he make the, 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 the message of go and preach, he make it in a You Now, you don't go as a church again. You preach to everyone that God opportunity to come to you. Sometimes God is saying, bring somebody to you that has given his like his people. You are not, not the one that will not talk to the person, not as a church body in the game. Ever what told you? They look for members. And the more they have members, the more the, the more how more they are, they see they are looking for members. Like so now, like a winner shop and now that I have the member, what are you looking for people? Because in their church today, they do four service. And out of the four service, you have more than 50,000 members. You are still looking for members. But with the message of Christ now, with the gospel, it's like individual preaching. There is no deal that God will not bring somebody to you that one issue, you, the other that you have to talk to. And you are not allowed to talk to them about, about the financial system of the world. You are just allowed to preach gospel to them. I think that is the, that is the message of the gospel. The, the crippled church, the made church not have the value that they have been given. Even that it's only by going to church that you can have that value. But now, what you do is you just take the children of God out of church setting, now put it individually. Now, it is day somebody must come to you that you must talk to that which you know about Jesus. I think that is that is what I say about the. Yes, 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 the instruction is given to all believers. Look, let, let me let me let me point out something that always interested me. You know, the disciples at a certain time said that we should not be bothering with tables. We want to devote our attention to the word. Uh, word, so word. they created another section of people that are supposed to be waiting tables, all right? So that they will be focused on the gospel, etc. But you know what happened? The people that they said should be waiting tables, that was where God started to manifest. Go and, <laughs> go and you know, go and look at the scripture. The people that, that they said should be waiting tables, uh, they were the ones where God did wonders and miracles among the people, okay? So God does not, <laughs> you know, they, they, are now, they are now big people that were beyond waiting tables for where? Um, last week I was having this video with somebody on um, regarding to, um, to a message about um, things in the Bible. The message was referring to all these um, pastors, see they don't want to say no more than them. And I told you, see, you can read them from Genesis to Revelation and you not see anything because those things God has in them. And somebody will just read today and go open it to see. Right. And I, I also quote as a John now, he said, You that you say you can see, you are blind. And somebody that agrees that they cannot see, God open his eye. In all those things that they even though they've been reading it, it does how God decided to preach the gospel to make the salvation. He's going to make the first to become last and last to become first. And in doing that, everything has to be crippled. That even though the first will not even be sure of his firstness again, 
I realized that the last, you know, you show that he's the last person, and him we still will be the only one determining everything. That just goes through, and that more contribution. Thank God, thank God for that. Ike. Uh, morning, sir. Morning, everyone. Morning. How did I know um, it was you? It was you. <laughs> you. You've always been guessing right, so I stopped that. <laughs> okay. Uh, in, in relation to what uh, Martin's asked about um, preaching, although I have a follow-up question relating to it, which I'm not sure it, whether it's related, but I, I remember I was I was talking to someone. I was preaching the word. First of all, he, he told me that uh, I, I should stop preaching to him. And by the way, who have I been able to convince about these things? That I'm about? <laughs> <laughs> so, <you know. laughs> and and he he was he was quite right because what I was saying uh, I, when I I thought about it, I realized that um, it, not everyone would uh, accept what I was saying. But my, my main question is, there's this verse where God, uh, Jesus says, um, do not uh, throw your pearls before dogs or they will right. trample you. Yeah. It, is it, because I always felt it was, don't go preaching to people that won't uh, listen to you also, you know, because you're preaching the word, which is your treasure. You understand? I don't know if that is a wrong uh, interpretation on my part. Well, you know, how do you know somebody will not, you know, but the, the truth of the matter is that there are some people, if you start to talk to them, I mean, they are going to, you know, they, they, recently I had to to block some people off my Twitter page because of the rubbish that they were saying there. And I was trying to tell them that, look, you know, this is my page. You know that I can block you. Um, so there are some people who don't waste your time with them. I mean, if you, if you start talking to them, you can see that this one is <laughs> not going to happen. It is God that has to break this one down. Huh? So don't, because he's going to be scornful. He's going to despise God. He's going to, you know, I mean, he's going to, what was the, the you, you, you were around when somebody was calling God, uh, what was the, what was um, this man calling God? Forgotten what you you know had some expression when we were when we used to have this discussion on on uh, on, on oh, that, that, that father or something he is it that character? spaghetti something or whatever you know I mean Man also. you know I mean people have all kinds of things that we just that that, that we just offend your spirit don't even bother trying to argue with those ones just leave them <laughs> just that's that's the way I understand that. But you cannot, you know, you cannot say, I won't going to preach to this because this one, I won't going to preach to that. No. Um, but you can tell immediately when you start talking to somebody that this one is going to despise what you're saying. Okay. Thank you. Do you have a testimony you want to share? There should be testimonies in healing wings. It is a time for testimonies. Can I see your hand up if you have a testimony you want to share? Yes. This one is Uzo. Y yes, sir. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay, so um, my testimony is actually about the God of the impossible. And um, it relates to these three nights of um, prayers that we just had. So um, on the first, I, I've been, I was ill um, during the week and uh, I couldn't go to work on one of the days. So I've been ill. And um, I had decided that I was going to go for the three nights of prayers, you know. So the first uh, night of prayer, that first day, uh, I was really very weak and extremely, uh, I was weak. So I, I had set my alarm and said I would join, you know, but I, I was tired. So I told God that 
if you want me to go for these uh, prayers, you will wake me up to go for the prayers, you know, but I didn't wake up, not I didn't wake up, God didn't wake me up for the prayer, then I removed my alarm. So that night I had a dream and in that dream, there were some people in the prayer meeting and it was the prayer meeting because in the dream, I knew it was the prayer meeting, you know, and they, they were praying in a room and I now was with someone and I told the person um, how I wish that this was happening in the village. I really don't know what that means yet, but that was my first experience with the prayer meeting on that first night. Um, should I say night or morning? Because it was morning. And um, when that, um, I woke up in the morning after really waking up, I joined the prayer meeting because it's on YouTube. So you can actually, you are in the prayer meeting anyway. So I, you know, still listening to it in the morning as I was taking my bath and all that. So that was day one, you know. So um, on Friday, Friday, I was like, for sure, I was still talking to God. By that time, I was fine. I was healed. I was good. You understand? I was still talking to God that I would go for the remaining two days because it was on a weekend, you know. So the second day, which was, I think that was Friday into Saturday morning, Saturday morning. Um, I still, the same thing, I set like my three alarms for three different times when I needed to be up and I didn't get to join. Uh, I think the first time when the first alarm rang, I was getting close to that time. I was like, okay, I still have time. I would join, but I didn't join the prayer meeting at that time. So in the morning when I woke up, I went to sit at my table. I, I shut, okay, before I got to my table, I actually put the prayer meeting um on youtube and started listening to it as i took a shower and i went to sit at the table because i wanted to read you know so I was, it was the prayer meeting was ongoing and as i was listening to the um prayer meeting when i sat at my table god i had this um, discussion with god that i'm not going to when the prayers are going on i won't be doing something else while prayers are going on so i need to actually pray Whenever, whatever prayers, not necessarily prayers for healing with any opportunity that there is to pray. So I quickly, uh, I just put set aside my books on my table and I started praying. And as we were praying, you know, the Holy Spirit slew me. I don't know how to describe what happened, but I take it as being slayed because um, the doctor said one word, you know, before then you had said during the prayer that it is impossible for you to be in this prayer and not be healed you know and when he said it I said it is impossible I the same thing I told myself and God that it is impossible for me to be here and not to be healed you know so he said a word and the Holy Spirit slew me and you know I started laugh, the Holy Spirit started laughing and screaming and you know and pushed me to my knees you know and I was praying and praying and, you know, not praying, but speaking in tongues, you know, the Holy Spirit was just laughing, laughing, laughing and all that. So I knew that, you know, God has, you know, that the word that you said was a prayer and it was actually for me. So that word, everything, I knew that it was a confirmation, you know, and God told me some things during that time, you know, and he told me this um, Bible verse and he said, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may know what is that good and perfect will of God. And that was the word he gave me. And he told me some other things during that time. It was like the, God was just, he was talking to me during that time. So that was day two. You understand? Day three is today. This morning, early this morning. Okay. So the, um, this morning, I, did, I still didn't join at night, just to tell you. And, and when I woke up this morning, I told God, I set an alarm. Why didn't this alarm wake me? And I couldn't, I didn't have an explanation for why. The, I, I didn't remember the alarm. I didn't hear any alarm. Nobody, I didn't wake up. Nothing happened. So I was like, okay. I joined the prayers again. I went on YouTube. I started the prayers this morning. Now, before we, I went for the prayers, Ike and I, we, we had an argument, so we fought, and we had a, well, not a fight fight, but we had an argument about something. So immediately I entered the prayers, 
and I joined the prayers. The first prayer that was being prayed for was about marriages and how we need to like you two two cannot um, be together if they don't agree. You said you said can two work together except they agree. You understand? So I before I got into that prayer meeting, I'd already told God because he told me one thing about myself that he said me I don't know how to do. So I told God, okay, you know, I was already like, oh, I'm right, of course, in this, of course, I'm right. But since he said this thing about me, let me just still pray about it. You understand? So once I joined the prayer meeting, it was exactly. It, it just, it was like, oh, we are fighting and I'm entering here and God is talking to me exactly about the marriage and all that. So it was just like, a, I don't know. But while we were praying anyway, God told me, he said, he said that again, that I am the God of the impossible. And he told me something that he said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. That was the word that he gave me. One of, he gave me two actually during that time. I'll say the second one. While we were, we were praying during this morning's um, prayers, I'm saying we, I wasn't there when he was saying, but I was there anyway, because while we were praying, we prayed for Nigeria. That was, by that time, God had not given me this word. You understand? We also prayed for Nigeria and we prayed for the children. You know, and I knew, I don't know, I knew with, I know with all certainty that every single prayer that was said there was answered. And it is God that decided that we should pray. And it is him that put that prayer. And he actually, that prayer is for his children. And that's why he said, if my people, because that, I know that um, Bible verse, but i had never really understood it. The Bible verse is about his people you know, humbling themselves and calling his name and he will surely answer. So it is, I just want to confirm what was said and what he said and to tell everybody that if you were not there at that time, because I didn't know why I was not there. It was at the end that I knew this morning that God told me why I wasn't there at night. Because if I was there at night at that time, I was really tired and I wasn't really feeling well in the beginning, I would not have been able to focus and pray and God needed to talk to me and the Holy Spirit needed us to all be part of that prayer. That prayer is for the children of God. It is for the sons of God. So everybody, that prayer is for all of us, every single one of us. So whether we were there or we were not there, we need to agree with the prayers that were said because they are coming to pass. Every single word that was spoken, whether it is about finances, whether it was about the children, Nigeria, all the prayers that were prayed, they are actually coming to pass. They are God's word in our life and his word can never return to him. And the last thing that God told me, and it's funny because when I heard it, when you were sharing the message this um, morning, when I heard it, I was like, are you adding this one, Uzo, or is it part of your... You understand? And it, because it was at the end, you understand? And he said, it's about the mustard seed. And he said, if you have faith, the one that says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, be thou removed, and the mountain will be moved. So for me, it was when you were started preaching and talking about the mustard seed that I even fully understood what God was trying to say about the what he told me this morning, this was all before the children's service, that the prayers that we are praying, eh, the, the, it started off with him introducing himself and saying, I did not know him before as the God of the impossible. I just met, I don't know if you can believe that I did not know the God of the impossible. I just met the God of the impossible. So he's trying to say that he is the God of the impossible. If you can just have faith, like a mustard seed, whatever it is that you pray for, that's every single prayer that we have prayed for, whatever it is that you ask, you understand? He will do it because he is the God of the impossible. So his job, he does impossible things and he's going to do some very impossible things for us. That is why we're talking about healing people's blood. There are impossible things that he wants to do and he's doing and he's going to do. So we have to all just be ready for what God is doing. And let's not take for granted these three days of prayers. It came 
from the almighty Jehovah. And I know, and I just bless the almighty God. And I just thank him because he's going to fulfill every single prayer that he has brought forth. May the name of the Lord be glorified in the mighty name of Jesus. That's my testimony. Amen, 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 amen. Thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God. Christine Ukwa. Good morning, Doctor. Okay. No, it's Christine. You guys are okay. right. Um, I just want to thank God. I realized that I never shared this particular testimony. Um, sometime last year, uh, in the space rental business that we run here at our place, uh, we had this particular client who, from uh, the history of running the place, we considered him to be one of the best clients that we've had. We had him come forward. He had been around with us for like a year plus, you know, uh, it was a church group. They were running services for like, uh, I think two days in the week. So they came forward at some point and told us that, oh, they'll be rounding up their uh, rental with us by September last year. Because uh, where they had access to a venue for just two days in the week, they had gotten somewhere else where they had full access to, you know, that's a good thing nonetheless. So. Um, we were happy for them. And at the same time, I was concerned because I was like, God, how this is gonna, it's going to disrupt finances and the likes, you know? So um, unknown to us, God had his plans because uh, just around the time, the month he was leaving, there was this uh, gentleman, another pastor who came forward and had started discussions with Sam. Uh, by the time this other pastor, that's the new person, came and started his services. I had so many problems with uh, the way his own uh, operations were going. I know some, first off, we have two venues. We have a much bigger venue that sits like uh, 150 to 180 guests. And then we have a smaller space that sits, say, 36, 20, 36 persons. Now, this gentleman comes and says he wants to use the biggest space. Okay, the Sunday service came and uh, I saw just like, as in, I, I was watching from the upstairs window. I, I didn't see cars, nobody around. And I was just hearing people, you know, like two or three people singing at the back space. I said, okay, perhaps other members are coming in, being a new venue for them. The next Sunday, the third Sunday, the fourth Sunday, just a number of people. And I asked them, why is this man using the big space? Why don't they come and use the small space? Why take on such a big space? And at some point, someone had to ask me, what is your own? Is it your money he's using to pay for the venue? <laughs> and I said, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. How can he, just three people, three members in his church and him coming to use the big space, pay more, uh, more, uh, a lot more money when he could pay less. And, and then, Somewhere by, as the months went by, where the policy is that, okay, the, the, the uh, group using the space should pay months ahead, he started doing per Sunday. You know, some Saturdays he will arrive, oh, he came to pay for this Sunday. I, I felt that was another grounds on which we should say no to his uh, bookings. I told Sam, look, look at this guy. Just per Sunday, what is this? He's struggling to pay. Then one day the Lord made, struck me with something. He said, look, this is a raven being used to feed the prophets. You just don't get it. From that day onwards, I stopped because God just used that gentleman to be making provisions for us, unknown to me, because it's, it beats human like understanding how he, a small group, would be using the big venues, paying somehow, because there were some uh, pastors who came around or some other groups that were like, how is this man paying for you people's venue every Sunday? And I realized it's no longer a question to ask because it was just God making provision. And then sometime by this year, another group now came, a bigger uh, uh, number came to use the backspace. And I told Sam, whatever you do, do not just disrupt the three people service man. Do not disrupt them. It is God who is going to take control because I, God has opened my eyes to understand. And even Sam confirmed it, that God was using him as a proverbial raven to feed the prophet. So when this new group came and Sam was still discussing with them and the pastor was saying, look, he really likes this venue. Sam should talk to this smaller group to go into the, into the main building while he does at the back. Sam told him, look, pastor, you just go and pray and leave everything to God. <laughs> now, then on a Saturday, our three group 
pastor came to Sam and my our thought was okay, he came to make his usual payment for service the next Sunday. Instead, he came and his discussion with Sam was, oh, that uh, he met a friend of his after one of their pastor's convention and the person showed him a venue and told him he should come and use it for free in the back of their house. So that that's where he's moving to. So that was how without any conflict of any sort, God took him out and then brought in another group, okay, that is seemingly a bigger group to come and start having service. And I just want to give that God all the thanks for his provisions. You know, even when we do not know, understand, you, you, if you step back and think about it, you just see God's hands. And I, I thank him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> that's a wonderful, that, well, as far as I'm concerned, that's a wonderful testimony. It's a wonderful testimony. Uh, God is always up to something. Yes. Or is it Sam? Mrs. Mwagbarocha. Go ahead. Good morning, church. It's Chukwamaka. Okay. I just want to thank God for what he has done for me, for my family. I want to thank God for divine healing for my children. Throughout last week, they had been running temperature, having this severe cough, especially sparkle. That I don't know, this minute her body temperature is so high, and then the next minute it is normal. The next minute she is cold. I had been giving her medication, but we hadn't taken her to the hospital yet. So last night she was so weak and I was scared. When my husband came back, I told him that, please, I don't know, my heart is cutting by the second. I am not comfortable with Sparkle's health at all. She is looking very weak. Please, we need to take her to the hospital. And at that point, Sparkle was so down. She couldn't eat nothing. She was just pale. And, and her body temperature was very high. I said, God, I know you, you, can, you can heal her. There is nothing you cannot do. And then immediately we started, I said, I must join this video. No, nothing will stop me from joining this video. I must do this video. God, you have to heal Sparkle for me. So immediately the video started from the prayer for couples to children, immediately go to children. I saw Sparkle that was just so weak to stand up. The next thing she, she started sweating and then started jumping. She was moving up and down. <laughs> Stay at a place. Is the one making noise now. She couldn't even stay at a place. I just want to give God the praise for divine healing, and God indeed answers prayers. That's my testimony. Praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, it's a wonderful, wonderful God. Ah, God is. You are great. You are great. God of healing weeks. Yes. Yeah, me see. It was just um, something that Uza said that um, brought to mind something that happened um, on the first night of the prayer. I have to admit that like towards the end, sometimes I nodded off. So maybe because of that, I didn't remember, you know, um, uh, what had happened, but um, it was Mr. Obi that was praying. So I think, um, am I mixing it up? There was a yeah. There was a yes, Mr. There, was a prayer, there was a prayer request yeah. for um, someone from Begay, and then Mr. B took the prayer. And before that, everything was just you know just praying like everybody else. And immediately, Mr. B started praying. The gear changed. So I was and I just immediately started speaking in tongues, and it was as if something. And this doesn't happen often, but it happens sometimes where there's just a kind of, something just breaks. So I just started praying in tongues. And what, again, Uza brought to mind was that sometimes you'll be praying and then the person will start repeating what you are praying. But you're not in the same place. So Mr. B is saying something and then your spirit is repeating the same thing. So that was a very significant point of that prayer for me and I was praying for a particular person at that point I after the service I went away and I slept and that person came up in my dream 
So um, it was, a, it, I mean, I didn't feel that point come up in the second and the third night, but there was something very powerful that happened on that first night. And I, I don't know how to define it, but I know going by how, you know, that um, speaking in tongues kicked into gear and just, the, you know, the power I felt around um, the prayers that were being said for the lady who was um, ill. So that's what I wanted to say. Okay, thank God. I have a testimony, one or two, uh, you know, um, I, I, I've always said that I don't know well, I, I just believe that God chastises me more than anybody else. But you know, when I met God, uh, I answered an altar call, invited the Holy Spirit into my life. And then he taught me a song. I woke up, I was singing the song in my sleep. And I woke up singing the song when the spirit of the Lord is upon my soul. I've never had the song before in my life. And I sang the song, sang the song. Everybody was fed up with me. And when we got to church, Femi went inside and came running out and said, they are singing the same song. The whole church was singing when the spirit of the Lord, you know, and I discovered that it's in the scriptures. God gives us songs in the night. That was my introduction to the Holy Spirit. More recently, like six months to a year, I discovered a different phenomenon that the Holy Spirit sings at the back of my head throughout the day. He is just singing praise songs. I can be doing something else I can be walking, I can be reading. There is a praise song that is going on at the back of my head. And this has really excited me. But about three days ago, I discovered it in the scriptures and I'm gonna show it to you. I didn't know it existed, but the Lord, showed it to me and very peculiar scripture. Zephaniah, in fact, is, is that it is it's on two occasions in the scripture. I'm just going to just read one. Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will say, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I've read this scripture several times, but I never saw it. It is God himself that will do the singing. He will rejoice. The Holy Spirit will rejoice over you with singing. This is one of the greatest compliments that I have ever received from God, that God is rejoicing over me with singing. I'm going to pray in a minute that it's going to happen to every single member of Healing Wings. There is nothing I receive that is not for every single member of Healing Wings. The other, the other testimony was a member of, of, of the church, not here now, who phoned me and said, somebody stole her mother's passport. And could I pray that the passport should be returned? And I said, do you want me to pray now? She said, yes, and said a short prayer, and that was it. And then um, I saw her the next day, and she didn't say anything about it. But when I was leaving, the Lord said, phone her and ask her about the passport. I phoned her and asked her about the passport. And she, I said, and she said, oh, she's got it back. She, you know, and I said, but you didn't mention it. He said, oh, no, 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 I forgot because I went, I went to see her because she asked me to come and pray. Um, um, you know, but that the person somehow brought it back. The person who took the, the thing brought, brought it back. Uh, let us pray. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. I'm going to say, Lord God Almighty, 
I never knew. I never knew. There are certain things, Lord God Almighty, that, that you have revealed to me. Huh? Time was when you would come, you would visit me, and you will completely enfold, completely cover me with the blankets. And I would have to stay absolutely still. If I moved, you, 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 you moved away. And then I discovered it in the scriptures. You will cover us with your feathers. And it, it was there in the scriptures. Lord God Almighty. Now I have discovered this, this, this one in the scriptures that you rejoice over your people with singing. I say certain things about you that people don't believe. I say, I have fellowship with you and you have pleaded with me to continue, not to leave. People say, how can God do this? I say, I'm just talking about my experience, my God and my father. You have told me, Lord, everything that you give me is for this body of Christ, is for this people of God. You have told me about the people in healing wings. You said, we are the apple of your eye. And so, Lord God Almighty, I pray that he will bring this testimony because you will do it in their life. You will rejoice over them with singing. They will hear you singing at the back of their head because, oh God, you will delight in your people. Thank you, mighty God. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Say to the righteous, it is well with you. You are the apple of God's eye. In Jesus' name, amen. It is well with you. You are the apple of God's eye. You are the apple of God's eye.